Yeah. It's like molecules and gas. Yeah. <laughs> I'm inflating. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming to the April meeting of skyscrapers. I'm very pleased tonight to have uh, with us Professor Alan Booth. He's the Victor Weisskopf Professor of Physics at MIT and uh, also author of this book, The Inflationary Universe, father of the inflationary theory, I think. Pretty fair to say. Uh, Professor Booth uh, started off as a uh, particle theorist a number of years ago and then was sort of dragged into cosmology, he tells me, by a friend named Henry Tai while they were at Cornell. And uh, among other things, he is noted for winning the messiest desk or messiest office in Boston award a couple of years ago. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so he fits in well with many of us who, you know, collect things and can't part with anything. And so I'm sure he'll you know, enjoy meeting him. Um, he's going to talk to us tonight about the inflationary universe and. I'm not going to get into it because I don't know enough about it, although I have been reading his book and learning more about it. And I think with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Professor Alan Guth, and uh, say thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Steve. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's great to see such a wonderful turnout, and uh, I think we'll have fun. Um, let's see. Let me First, turn this thing point in the right direction. There's my title transparency. Um, I'll be talking tonight about inflationary cosmology, which is a twist on the Big Bang that uh, I've been involved on in developing. Um, I hope the talk will be very informal, so by all means, feel free to interrupt whatever you want. I assume that's probably the tradition around here, but I thought I'd just make sure you knew that I, uh, I would like that. Um, I'll try to start at the beginning and get to the end, uh, and... Uh, I'll, I'll try to tell you everything that's, that's relevant. Uh, I'll assume that, uh, I'm not sure some of you know an awful lot about this and others don't, so I'll, I'll assume that all of you are very smart, but I'll try to not assume much knowledge. Uh, but if I'm going too fast or too slow or whatever, you try to tell me. Um, I should maybe mention that uh, I did start out in, in particle theory, uh, as Steve said. Um, there were actually a large number of particle theorists uh, who got uh, dragged into cosmology at about the same time I did, around 1980 or so. Uh, it, we were driven partly by what was going on in particle physics at the time. Uh, at that time, it was sort of the advent of a new class of particle theories called grand unified theories. And uh, the key feature of these particle theories that made cosmology relevant to them uh, was that they made their most spectacular predictions uh, at energy scales uh, of order of 10 to the 16 GeV or so. Uh, and the key point is that that energy is, uh, well, it's not that much by the standards of your local power company. It's about what it takes to light a 100-watt bulb for a, a few hours. Uh, but we're talking about having that much energy on a single elementary particle, uh, and that is extraordinary and well beyond the range of accelerators. Uh, you can do a simple back-of-the-envelope calculation to ask how big an accelerator would have to be uh, to reach those energies. And you can imagine doing it just by scaling up uh, a large linear accelerator. Uh, the, the largest linear accelerator in the world today is SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Uh, and it has a length of about two miles and can reach an energy of uh, about 80 GeV. So we want to go from 80 to 10 to the 16th. Um, so you could, you could do the back of the envelope calculation. And if I remember right, uh, the answer is that the... Uh, the accelerator has to be about 70 light years long. <laughs> um, and uh, we were disappointed that uh, the Department of Energy was not interested in funding that. Uh, so, so what it meant is that if, if us particle theorists uh, wanted to have any access uh, to uh, any accelerator at all that has ever reached those energies, uh, that turns out to be the universe itself uh, in its very infancy. Uh, according to conventional cosmology, and inflation doesn't really change this actually, uh, the universe uh, would have had a temperature where that was the average thermal energy uh, at about 10 to the minus 37 seconds after the instant of the Big Bang. Uh, so that's a pretty extraordinary time period to try to think about, uh, and when I first started working on it, it seemed completely crazy, but 
then when I heard a lot of other people saying the same crazy things, eventually it stopped sounding so crazy. Um, so that, that was really the impetus for, for this work. And it has led to some very interesting cosmological predictions, which I'll show you seem to actually work, which I, I find fantastic. Uh, so let me start at the beginning, as I promised to. I guess when you talk about the early universe, you should start at the beginning. Uh, so uh, first, the conventional Big Bang theory, uh, called the standard Big Bang. Um, the standard Big Bang is the theory uh, that the universe, as we know it, uh, began about 13 to 15 billion years ago. And now we think we even know that number pretty accurately, 13.7 uh, billion years, plus or minus just 0 0.2. Uh, we usually like to stick in these words like the universe as we know it. That's to cover our, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, obviously, we don't know what happened before the Big Bang or whether there was something before the Big Bang. Uh, but if we extrapolate backwards, the region that we're living in was, uh, at that time, uh, incredibly hot, incredibly dense, and impro approaching uh, literally infinite density, although we doubt it really, ever really was infinite. Uh, the initial state, meaning the state 13.7 billion years ago, uh, was a hot, dense, uniform soup of particles, uh, which, by the way, uh, I think a lot of people are not aware of this. Uh, the assumption of this conventional Big Bang theory is that these particles filled space uniformly uh, right from the beginning. Uh, so there's a, a common cartoon image of the Big Bang as you know, an egg that exploded into empty space. Uh, that's not the way the scientific theory of the Big Bang works. Uh, I don't know of anything that's less plausible about the egg theory than the theory we, we actually believe uh, in terms of a priori logic. Uh, but in terms of what we observe, uh, the point is that when we look around the universe, uh, what we see really looks the same no matter what direction we look. And if there was an egg that exploded, then you would certainly expect that if you look toward the egg, you would see something that would look very different from what you'd see if you looked the other way. Uh, so we don't see any signs of an egg. It looks like everything is just uniform, and uh, apparently uniform from the very beginning. Okay, uh, so this standard or conventional Big Bang theory describes how the early universe expanded and cooled. Uh, it describes how the light chemical elements formed. Uh, the theory starts when the universe was so hot that even the nuclei of atoms uh, would not have been stable. Uh, so nuclei have to form as the universe cools. And you can actually calculate uh, what kinds of nuclear reactions one expects would take place under those conditions and what would result from it. And you can make predictions uh, for the abundances of the chemical elements. Now, it turns out uh, that most of the chemical elements we see around us were not produced in the Big Bang. Uh, but as you probably know, they were produced much later in the history of the universe uh, in the interior of stars, which then undergo supernova explosions and scatter these elements out uh, ready to recollect into later generation stars. And our sun would be one of those later generation stars, uh, rich with chemical elements uh, that were synthesized in earlier stars. Uh, but the lightest chemical elements that exist, uh, namely the different isotopes of hydrogen and helium and a few isotopes of lithium, uh, were produced primarily in the Big Bang. And the Big Bang theory can really be used to calculate the expected abundances of those nuclei uh, and it works. It really is one of the big successes of the classical Big Bang theory. We can actually understand where those chemical elements come from and make correct predictions for how much of those elements we should observe. Uh, the theory also describes uh, how the matter in the universe eventually congealed to form stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies and all those things that you people probably spend your time looking at. Um, this is still certainly a work in progress. We don't claim to completely understand everything about structure formation in the universe. Uh, but the basic theory is in place and uh, seems to work as well as we'd expect it to work given the approximations that always go into uh, any realistic calculations. So we think that in principle that problem is understood, although there are obviously things to learn uh, about the details. So that's the good news for the standard Big Bang model. Um, now, what I really want to talk about today is what the standard Big Bang model does not describe. 